Boom, boom. Hello, 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 hello. Hey, Patricia, so nice to have you here today in our Stones and Glasses. This is a free flow interview series that we are doing. And I'm super glad to, to have you here part of this. We haven't talked for years. And so this is also a, a first time reconnecting. Uh, and then at the same time doing this in a way that others will be able to see. We are we are we are live streaming, but just on our YouTube channel, and we will be doing all the assets creation and communication after that. So you get all of this. So yes, thank you so much for being here, Patricia. And yeah, so welcome. And um, maybe just at the start, you could tell, talk uh, a bit about yourself. I had the pleasure of knowing you for many years and um, you've been working on this concept that you very nicely branded upside down thinking. And um, maybe that's a, that's a good sharp way to kind of uh, share how you think about innovation and the world and how you de developed your own frameworks based on so many interviews and exposure that you had to different leaders um, all over the world. So yeah, welcome Patricia. You could start maybe just giving your introduction of yourself and then we can jump into more philosophical conversation. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I must first thank you for letting me so scared on a Monday afternoon uh, because free flow and live interview, it's pretty frightening for control free by myself. So I think it's interesting as an upside down experience to allow myself to open up to what comes. I usually do that, but on a very private way. So doing that publicly to me, it's, it's pretty, pretty upside down. Um, so speaking about me briefly, maybe, um, one thing that strongly defines me is that I'm originally from Rio, and that says a lot about my story, my history, <laughs> because um, I always wanted to run away from Rio since I was very young. I was curious to, to understand myself through going beyond the borders, the frontiers I've known, and I've done everything I could to move away from Rio, to study abroad, to work abroad, on and on and on. And, and now I feel more than ever that I'm a Carioca. I feel more that I'm from Rio than even from Brazil. So I think it tells a lot about my choices, my career choices and life choices. Wanting to move away, but also never forgetting once I'm flying from what I come from, from my roots. So... In a nutshell, during 10 years, I had a pretty um, maybe traditional career path in Rio as a marketing communication executive. And I felt every two or three years the urge of changing, changing boss, changing scenery, changing industry. Um, and it didn't last long, like the satisfaction of changing. And I was very uh, confused with that. I wanted to understand why why I was feeling like, like repeating myself while changing. And then it leads to my upside down thinking work because I've learned throughout many changes that change is pretty different than transforming. And in order to transform, you need to deep dive into what I call a known, known, known. So this is the very essence of what I do and what I believe. Um, going beyond the known, it's unnatural, it's painful, but yet very rewarding. That's very nice. And just like, okay, you were working in this sort of marketing, the marketing world and communications, and then you had some sort of like decision in your life to kind of like go a bit more meta and try to understand what actually matters, right? And... Uh, in terms of like frameworks for innovation or frameworks for decision making so that you can take better better yeah better conclusions and advance the processes within organizations or individually as well could you share what 
made you go to this and what did you learn in this process? Yes, um, it will be hard um, to make it concise, but I'll try my best. Um, Don't worry about what... being concise. If you, okay. need, if you need time, Great. just go for it. Okay. Um, what led me mainly to try to tackle, to better understand change was frustration on a personal and professional basis. I observed that between intention and action, there's a huge gap of um, non-visible issues that prevents you from changing. So I've worked in company that were facing somehow big change management programs and moments, leadership-wise, uh, business-wise, branding-wise. And there was always this sensation that uh, neither the company nor the leadership of the company was in its full potential. And I didn't understand why initially. And myself as well, when I was changing jobs and changing cities, I felt as well that I wasn't really at my highest potential possible. Um, and I wanted to understand and to learn more about that. And when I was seeking for more like conventional reference, I wasn't really convinced. So I went to study at a place called Berlin School of Creative Leadership, which is a um, school based in Berlin, Germany, but with modules in Asia, in the US. So in Tokyo, Shanghai, New York, California. And I've learned finally that innovating and changing depends directly on the terroir, on the ground in which your company or your soul is based originally. So changing for Germans is pretty different than from Americans and Chinese and Japanese and Brazilians. And by being a Brazilian, a Carioca, living in Berlin, studying Berlin, I was very confused when I understood that skepticism and pessimism are a perfectly reasonable mindset as well as optimism. Um, it both made sense if you wanted it to make sense. So, for example, Pedro, you are Brazilian as well. Uh, and you probably heard many times in your life, everything will work out fine. Vai dar tudo certo, se Deus quiser. God in Brazil is probably with burnout at this stage, right? Because we evoke God's help and this sense of obsessive optimism, no matter what. And it somehow makes sense for us. And when I went to live in study in Germany and had a German boyfriend, I was very touched by the idea that coming up with apparently good news provoked not optimism, but many times skepticism and pessimism. Like, are you sure this is going to work well, out fine? Why? Why would it work out? So I understood that in order to change, you, you need to understand from what you're coming from whether this is pessimism, optimism, your cultural background, your state of spirit, your deep beliefs, you need to challenge that. And this is very painful and very unnatural because it's about challenge, challenging one's identity. So I think that this, this was my main interest, understanding how you can go beyond and deeper in terms of change in both organizational structure and personal life. So during a year, I did a self-change experiment. I decided to do the contrary of what I have been doing for 10 years as an executive. For example, I had a blackberry, which, is, which was like a crackberry, I must say. And during a year, I had no phones. It was the most productive year of my life. Less active and more productive on a deep, deeper sense. So, yeah. Doing the contrary, doing exactly the opposite of what you truly believe or are used to may lead you to new sceneries, even more comfortable ones. Understood. And so you, when you say uncomfortable, I mean, I think like, as you said, said for you yourself as a control freak, right? And mm -hmm. uh, in, of course, in a jokey way. I mean, I don't think you're a total control freak, but yeah, you like to to understand the frameworks of things and act within that. And I think 
then in your research, trying to understand what brings innovation and what makes a systems be innovative, you also got confronted with this realization that you just mentioned that like in order to bring a different perspective, you have to go outside of your framework of control or understanding and you have to let yourself kind of be surprised by putting yourself in a situation that might seem uncomfortable, right? Yes, and just to be clear, I have nothing against comfort. And I think it's a cliche to say, I want to get out of my comfort zone. I always question that. Why? Why should you? Comfort is good. But the point is, when for a moment you allow yourself to test for a short while what seems to be discomfortable, then you can get surprised of how the unfamiliar becomes familiar and therefore comfortable. For example, the, the, the phone example. I was very comfortable of having this, this um, gadget with me all the time. It was an extension of my body and mind. And then I felt very uncomfortable initially without a phone. But then after many months, it was the contrary. I was shocked. I was living in zombie land and I didn't even notice that before I was phoneless, right? So it became very comfortable for me not having a phone and to be an observer, a voyeur, a flaneur in the cities I was, I was going um, to study and to, to research. So comfortable, having comfort, it's good, but uh, there are different ways of feeling comfortable and we don't test them as, as much as we could. For example, um, companies that are run by families, they are very comfortable, unconsciously or consciously, with the, with the blood ties that connects them, right? With the natural bonding they have. They're very comfortable with that. But for the business, somehow, this might be uncomfortable, right? If, if, if the family, it's, it's above any, anything else, the processes and also other people that are not part of the family. So challenging that might expand both the company and the family's consciousness, although it might be uncomfortable for a short while. Yes, and just to try to understand, I mean, I feel like... I could identify with like that. I mean, I love comfort myself and I think my life is very comfortable and I think I have like a set up structures that are able to accommodate myself. But I feel like I'm always on the edge of some some things. But when I'm navigating on the edge and putting myself in situations that are uncomfortable, where I learn mostly, uh, I feel like I need some structures that are comforting me on the background so it's just like you know it's just a balance between like making some things that gives you stability and then experimenting with other things that destabilize you so that you kind of keep growing right it's a dance between security and freedom we all need a certain level of security and a certain level of freedom but the level of freedom you need is different than mine and I think this is where comf comfort lives. When you mingle well, the level of, comf of, of, of security and freedom you need. So, so an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, for example, shouldn't be too attached to security, to predictability, right? Correct. Depending on which phase of his enterprise, yeah. Yeah. As a starting point, he should be freer than a person that works for the government, for example, for right? sure. Yes. Yeah, I mean, depending on which kind of freedom, right? If you consider that um, the person that works for the government has the freedom not to need to care about his their existence because they have this guaranteed job. And they could be somebody like Kafka, who was a governmental worker and he was free on his books. I don't know. I'm joking. It's relative. No, but this is a very clever structure Kafka did, right? He, he, he was a writer. Uh, he, he expressed himself uh, 
on his personal life, but also had this structure that allows him to do so. So this is this is a good example of comfortable, of comfort, yeah. right? Yeah. Mingling well what you need and what you want. Yeah, I think also like I can identify with that from the perspective of like, you know, sometimes you need to make you innovate, you're creating a product or service or something. Then you need to innovate on some areas, but then some you can't innovate on every area in every time because you have like constraints and so on. So I think you always have to kind of pick your battles, but like make sure that you never just optimize for only comfort, right? You need to optimize for growth and challenging yourself. And I think all of those things are kind of important, yeah. And to keep that 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 good balance. But let me just ask you something here. So about about the your work and all this research, I know you interviewed quite some people, and you looked at some case studies from different companies and uh, how they kind of were able to to um, maneuver to become more innovative, to become more interesting as a business, and therefore also be able to grow. And so, what are those key insights? What uh what is the framework there? How can how can your insights help people to make better decisions or become better leaders? So the starting point would be saying there's there's no such thing as a framework. For example, I use uh, in order to foster change in organizations my upside down thinking framework, but it shouldn't be attached to that because some companies are allergic to thinking upside down. And I must acknowledge, recognize, and, and, and work with that scenario, right? So one of my takeaways, of my research takeaways, so I, I traveled to nine countries and interviewed top CEOs from different companies, different industries, sectors, levels of maturity. And so one of my takeaways is that there's no such thing as one A framework, like that should be applied for everybody, anybody at any time. So this is the starting point. Not even upside down thinking that it's a framework in which I truly believe in and tested it several times with myself and with business, with several um, uh, environments. Uh, so yeah, so this is the starting point. There's no such thing as a framework that works for everybody. Um, I would love to believe in that my life will be easier. There was a formula, a recipe, but I don't believe in such thing at all. So the second thing is uh, understanding from what you're coming from. It's a very valuable um, starting point for promoting change. Looking backwards. One of my first experiences was in Berlin with a Belgium startup. And they, they wanted my help to think about their future, their five-year plan. And we spent four or five days in the woods, looking backwards, remembering from what they were coming from so that they could be better connected to, to build the structure for the future. So um, I think that understanding the terroir, the grounding, the story, the DNA of the company, it's a very nice starting point to change because many times companies get lost because they lose touch with the culture, with the founders, with the initial inspiration that um, fostered what they became. Uh, I remember when I went to the U.S. Midwest to interview, uh, by, by that time, Energizer's chairman, CEO. Um, he, his name is Ward Klein. And he told me, and, and I was very um, somehow embarrassed to ask him about the future of the brand because they were pr producing batteries, which is like old school batteries, which is certainly... A replaceable thing in a very near future but however i was very surprised with his innovative bold vision for energizer um, because it was not about the products only but it was more about he said his role, role being the minister of culture having a very consistent winning culture that allowed them to both sell batteries and be number one or two worldwide, but also having this newness um, approach to other categories that they could act on. So, yeah, I think culture is one of the key aspects as well. 
uh, in terms of takeaways from this research. Um, and my last thing, uh, there, there were many, but I'm, I'm synthesizing, but my, the last thing that really uh, caught my attention was the power of the invisible in change moments, in innovation projects. Uh, by invisible, I call what it's unconscious, um, not in a psychoanalytical level, but I'm talking about more concrete things like the voices of fear, cynicism, and judgment that are not acknowledged or voiced um, and that become concrete barriers in change moments, for example. Uh, so everything that is not said, that it's not apparently concrete, becomes um, very relevant in terms of, I don't know, obstacles. Understood. Um, I even changed the background of our video here because I was like, our oh, black doesn't fit us. I was just made, I made us blue now. I was like, okay. Yes. That was, it was too black for us. No, very interesting. Um, so you're saying there is no framework. You're saying uh, what you think is very important is to always understand this initial impulse, the purpose of these entrepreneurs or whoever were the people that started this organization and be able to be connected with that frame, with that sort of impulse and purpose. And so that you can, from this abstraction layer, which is, a purpose usually is not so concrete you are able to make decisions that are beyond this sort of like what you're doing but more about like how you can find different ways to solve uh, solutions and they might be cross different markets cross different ways of thinking but you need to have this identify and reconnect with the purpose of 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 the company is that correct it's correct. Uh, somehow, what I'm trying to say is that myopia is what prevents us from changing and innovating. And what does myopia mean? Uh, lo looking or seeing very well what it's close, what it's near, not being able to see the broader perspective of things, right? This is the main problem of business as usual. You get too attached to metrics, to short-term to implementing change for incremental uh, adjustments, but you don't see the broader perspective that will probably take you further to a more interesting place. For instance, Pedro, I don't know if you know, but the word disaster, disastri, disastros, mm -hmm. disaster means without stars. So mm -hmm. when we don't have this overview perspective on things, we tend to go towards disaster. So one of the things that I, I also think that harm change and harm innovation, it's, it's our fetish with velocity, with speed. Going fast in the wrong direction is a tragedy. So stepping back, looking backwards, pausing, might help us to prevent disaster. Yeah, but I think... Yes, exactly. But in order to connect with your stars, it, it's more also like connecting with why you're doing the things that you're doing as an organization or so that you can kind of think of how and what you can do in multiple ways that will align with that. Does that make sense? It does. And I think that, for example, the obsession now with purpose to me is a symptom of the lack of purpose. It's a compensation. Yes, exactly. And I mean, we work a lot. I mean, we have, we work, we think a lot about like the similar things in the sense that if without a clear purpose or it's really hard to get anything done because I mean, we believe that you don't want to micromanage people working with you. So you kind of want to give them some alignment of why and how you want to do things so that they can be more autonomous helping you to reach this, right? And uh, if you don't have that, then you have potential lots of other costs by trying to align people and micromanage them and you will not gonna get very good results in this process. Yeah, because the less management, the more micromanagement. 
and what makes you a good manager is having this. So what's the contrary of disaster, in my opinion? Consideration, considerious with the stars. So when you have a management perspective with all the stars, with all the cosmos that surrounds your company, your ecosystem, um, you don't, you, you will not be wired, I think, to micromanagement um, as a consequence yes. of that. Absolutely. And so, um, Patricia, tell, tell us, like, I mean, you've done all this research, you've been like helping organizations and leaders to make better decisions. And you do this also through, through, through your consulting work. And, but I know that you're always like busy thinking about new ideas and things to do. I don't know, but are you working on something else that you like to share? Are you, what are you thinking at this moment of your life? Also, maybe personally uh, in relationship to the world. And we, I mean, we live in this quite volatile environment right now. And I mean, Rio is volatile anyways. So what are, what are your thinkings personally and professionally? What are you looking at? Let me just correct you, Pedro. You said I help organizations. Sometimes I do the opposite. For example, I was, I was invited to help Uh, a company that wanted to think about the future and the partners were completely misaligned. And one of my takeaways by talking to them and trying to help them was saying that, uh, or dictating that I think the business should die. And they were very shocked with what I said initially. They were really shocked because they, they wanted me like to help them save the business. And I said, this is unsavable, not because of the business, but because of your misalignment. You really should um, give up on that. And they did one year after that. And they are both very happily uh, divorced now, business-wise. So helping, um, maybe it's not the right verb uh, because I might harm the business and even destroy. And... I don't see that with, with a bad perspective, like as a binary thing, like because saving a business can be bad as well as destroying a business can be good, depending on the lens, right? Anyway, so this is just a quick parenthesis because I'm not sure if I help. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, help and like you deconstruct everything that, that I try. Yeah, I know. try to be a shaker and I'm not convinced whether this is good or bad. This can be um thinking superficially about that very um i don't know mean or weird or natural yeah yeah i don't know i mean anyway if you think something is not aligned with the purpose and this the purpose for these people is a different one like even stopping with the activity is helping them in a way like i mean being delivering truly what just people if people pay you to tell you what they want to see then you become more like like a, you know it's not really what is expected from and i from think that yeah and i think this experience may connect me to my answer now so you you asked me what i have been thinking in this volatile world right mm. um in terms of dreams, objectives, I think that what really wires me now more than ever, it's, it's trying to bring freshness to tired systems, right? And that might include my life as well. So I think that the pandemic was an initiation, a collective initiation, an eye-opener for us to see with perspective and, and an invitation um, for more freshness into our lives. So I think, to me, on a personal basis, on a professional level as well, was a very interesting rethinking process. For example, uh, until March 2020, I was traveling like hell. Um, I, was, I felt like my life was very similar to a truck driver. Like I didn't sleep much at home. I was always on the roads. In, at airports I mean, the, and so on the forth. roads in the airport the planes right 
Yeah, or buses or cars on the road, not at home, not at home. And uh, the pandemic made me see that I didn't, I didn't have a real home. I had like a, a dormitory, a, a dormitory, like a place to, to go back, but not a place to stay, for example. Mm -hmm. And now uh, I feel I have shifted my, my relationship with traveling. I'm still, I'm still curious, interested in traveling for work, for life, doesn't matter, but I'm traveling differently, differently with more time, less and better. And I think this is an invitation for more quality and less quantity. Because I don't see myself, for example, as a, as a uh, consumerism never, never really wired me, right, to buy things. But I was a traveler uh, consumist, obsessive, um, obsessive client of traveling. And now, yeah, I'm rethinking. I'm enjoying more to be at home, to work from home, um, and to travel less and better when I do. This is one example. The second one, it's I have an unfinish unfinishable book that I've been trying to write for many years now, five years, I might say. And I'm really um, motivated to conclude it, although it's unfinishable. It's more about giving up on that than concluding, because it's not possible to conclude. It's it's about giving up. Giving up what? Like you need to accept As that at some point there is a stage. Yes, accepting perfection. As Just accepting make a version and make it digital. I don't want it to be digital. I want it to be handwritten, actually. Yeah, <laughs> this is, it this will is... never be ready. Yeah, let's Maybe see. You, Time will tell. Can do updates for people. Then you have to accept the, the printing costs will be a barrier for you to update it. Yeah, but uh, but you know, Pedro, I think that writing a book, it's an opportunity to be less utilitarian than when I have to deliver projects for clients, you know? There's a very clear outcome. The expectations are, are negotiated and communicated. So the book... In theory, it's mine. So therefore, I think it's it's a very nice, fresh space for experimentation, for rebellion, and childish childishness. What is the book title, and what is the book about? If you can share with us, upside down thinking. Mm. <laughs> it's a it's about it's about thinking the opposite to expand creativity and pragmatism in change moments mm -hmm. fascinating and uh, it doesn't seem so by your <laughs> it is fascinating i mean facial I know, expression <laughs> well i mean i am i'm trying to be also um not to like i'm trying to be like you know moderated if how i respond because i want to also give uh, the opportunity for the listeners to understand what you're saying. I'm not the important person here. So, yes. Um, yeah, we talked about upside down thinking, your thesis, your personal way of like getting there. I mean, I think it's also super interesting how you always connect with this hyper local perspective as the thing that form forms you. Like, I think that um, I remember you were doing this research also about like Rio and like and how to think about the city and like what is like context and all that makes who we are. I think like we have a lot of perhaps in our like more individual perspective, we have a lot of like, oh, I am this person because this is, this is how I think or this is my story. But you were just like saying I was born in Rio. That's the context and that's that's also who defines who who I am. Would you would you elaborate more on like how you come, like how this became important for you? Because I don't know if, if it was something that was always important for you or is it something that you realize being more important over the last years? Thank you for bringing that up because I, I love these topics. Rio and, and the Tehua from what you come from. I think this is this is this this works 
as a, as a lens to the world. It shapes us, whether we are aware of that or not. And not only from what you come from, but also where you decide to live. For example, I'm living in Sao Paulo. I will elaborate on Rio, but I'll, I'll leave my favorite topic for the, the end. But I'm living in Sao Paulo for a couple of years now. And Sao Paulo is a city that grew uh, from the prosperity, the wealth of coffee, right? And what is coffee? It's a plant that generates a drink that fosters productivity, right? Correct. When you are when you are caffeine driven, you are more wired to produce and do things, right? You are awake. So of course, São Paulo is an anxious city. Is a city wired by productivity. Of course, people here are more interested in knowing what you do than who you are, from what you come from, or even whether you're married or not. I'm always interested in that, knowing whether people are single or not and why. Um, so this is not a topic here. It's more about what you do. Uh, but tell me more about what you do. Um, and um, the culture of the city surrounds around work and the sense of dignity as well. It's about... Um, what you produce in the end of the day. Um, so I think it makes sense if you want to grow as a company to be here, if you are Brazilian, for example, more than in Rio. Rio, uh, on the other hand, um, has a very different story, history. And I don't know if you read or saw the film about a Kundera, Milan Kundera, um, A Insustentável Leveza do Ser, I don't no, know. I haven't. Um, but I know about the book, yeah. Yeah, so I think this, this would be Rio's slogan, the, the, the unbearable lightness of being, if I'm correct, uh, translating correctly. Um, I think this would be the perfect Rio slogan. Although Milan Condera was, was Czech, I think it resonates well with my city. Um, in Rio, it's not, to me, my, my opinion, not as important what you do, but um, being as light as possible um, and maybe even superficial, uh, to live well, to enjoy the sun, to allow yourself to be overwhelmed by nature. Um, so producing doesn't seem so important or not at least a priority in the city's culture. Therefore, the level of services are always weak and disappointing. So I think that understanding the terroir and the city's history helps a lot to understand what shapes the culture of the city and therefore the choices of the city. And I believe that the destiny is the origin. The destiny is the origin. And, and this is how I feel connected to Rio. I escaped from it. I moved away from it many times. And the more I did it, the more I valued from what I came from. So I think that... Uh, Getting in and out gives us perspective on who we are and why we act as we do. Yeah. And um, when you talk when you talk about moving in and out, right? What are the ways you can do that? Well, you can what travel with that. You can travel with, for example, you can you can move away and you can travel to other cities without changing your state of spirit, right? So it's a decision to mm -hmm. get in and out, both geographically and symbolically. For example, this is the main difference, in my opinion, between the tourist and the traveler, right? The tourists want to consume pictures, selfies, um, predictable stuff. So they are not really getting out of their original state. They're just reproducing what's expected. Whereas the traveler, you can be a traveler in your own city, of course, uh, has fresher eyes to understand what's new, what's old, and to experience things as they come without controlling as much. For example, I am in a tra I'm a traveler at the moment in our conversation. I have no idea of uh, what's coming next, and I'm trying to be as open as possible. Um, although that's not possible to be as open as possible. That's interesting. There are limits for that. Hmm. Hmm. So no recipe. 
no recipe. Well, I think that I would like to contradict myself. If there should be a recipe, that's, that's openness, curiosity, right? I wouldn't consider it a framework, but having open mind, open heart, open will might drive you to more interesting places. Yeah, so always constantly be open for new perspectives um, without psychedelics. I'm joking. Um, I've, I've tr well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm against drugs for myself, not for others, but uh, because I'm a control freak, I like to be lucid, sober, very aware of what's going on. But I've tried a couple of years ago, uh, holotropic breathing. Have you done that, Pedro? Yes, yes, yes. And, and I was shocked with how you can travel without psychedelics. It's amazing. Yes. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. It is like psychedelics. It yeah, is a but psychedelic I, effect. So, I mean, when I mean psychedelics, I mean just like accessing a state of consciousness that allows your mind and the subconscious to manifest. And you can do that through many ways meditating, running, whatever, uh, breathing. So, not necessarily through the use of. Uh, toxic or um, substances and so on so so i meant it in the broad sense of course yeah and it's amazing how how accessible it is and and how we don't access is you usually right yeah that is correct yeah so so yeah reaching the state of mind where you can kind of like be as as open as possible like a child somehow but then at the same time, um, at the same time, uh, know where you're coming from, right? Where, what are the purpose or the ideas that helped you to come to a certain decision? So in keeping connected with this sort of purpose, legacy purpose that you have. And then, yeah, being open and then being always having some fronts where you're kind of going away where it's comfortable for you maybe there's are some some key elements that we discussed here oh. but it's also about valuing comfort right that's the paradox it's 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 it's, oh, it's giving up on comfort to try test new things being mm -hmm. open and curious to experiment what seems uncomfortable but it's also yeah. accommodating comfort as as a a nice thing to have. Um, I think a tree would materialize um, very well what we have just talked. The tree is very well rooted. A big tree is well, very well rooted, has strong roots, but goes higher. The, the, a copper, the avari, right? The yeah. top of the tree uh, seeks for light and seeks, seeks for the stars, right? Mm -hmm. It's anti-disaster. Yeah. And it is, a, yeah, it goes through the stars while the roots goes down to compensate for it, right? Yep, so, are firmly grounded. So that's that's the paradox going in both directions at the same time to balance them out. And one doesn't exclude the other. So basically, if you want to be a better leader or if you have a, an organization and you want to make better decisions, you just have to kind of uh, evolve your mindset and there is no concrete recipe so therefore you have to actually just work on yourself and be a, a an amazing human being and then everything will follow because no it's not that it's not that simple but uh, i think pedro what what i would say as as a takeaway for leaders from my research is that there's a fine difference between doing things correctly versus doing the right thing questioning mm -hmm. what's the right thing that should be done for my mm -hmm. business for my life now considering the zeitgeist the spirit of the time considering the tehua where you're grounded from what you're coming from and and the answer the answer it's very particular right uh, only the leader can can find it no consultant can can really bring that up for him what what I or we or anyone can help is creating the right conditioning 
the right conditions for the thinking to emerge on a broader level, on a deeper level, on a more creative level. So doing things correctly for some leaders might be micromanaging, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe doing the right thing would be having um, a more appropriate management so that you don't need to micromanage. This is a seed yeah. example of that. Yeah, so you need to think smart. Yeah, for example, it's, I think it's about combating cliches, Pedro. Combating cliches. Why mm. do all, all, all the business need to be saved? Why do all the business need to grow? This is ridiculous. Yeah, there's this we don't live the in concept any... of like, I think, zombification, which is like all this business that actually just exists because they have like low interest rates and somehow they were able to get bonds and somehow there is a bunch of businesses that shouldn't be existing and that it's you need to die in order to make space for for something new right so and also exactly. to free your working force and so on it's about escaping from this gamified way of life way of doing business it's about so basically basically your thesis is like you need to you need to choose your pill take the red pill and get out of the matrix and only through talking to Patricia, you'll be able to do that. And there, <laughs> reading my unfinishable book, handwritten, like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> super easy. <laughs> hey, if you are a leader, you have to choose the pill. You have to get out of the matrix. Otherwise, there is no future for you. There That's, is a future within the matrix, you, but it's more limited and less you, you creative. Ba you basically are neon, right? <laughs> like no pedro i don't want to perceive as such i try right. to communicate the opposite like i'm not a savior i might destroy businesses i'm not even sure if my my work is valuable it is what it is uh so refreshing tired system has a cost um and mm -hmm. sometimes the cost so can be disastrous innovation is not good I think we should innovate with a higher level of consciousness. It's not innovating for innovating for the sake of innovating. It's not changing for the sake of changing. It's, it's about questioning, observing, connecting, and then experimenting the new. Right? Yeah. And you are advocating for like effectiveness is more important than efficient. Being efficient, right? Like you just need to be effective with what the decisions. And one thing that you also say that I interpret as such is that you think like because we live in this like times where like utilitarianism is so important and it seems like a god for our technologic driven society, you also want to question and and put some sort of questions and uh, around like if utilitarianism is the only way we should be making decisions uh, yeah if efficiency with... became another god as well pedro like why we, i like, why should I like we effectiveness be... i like effectiveness because i don't need to be efficient to be effective i just need mm -hmm. to you know i just can't do it i could sleep during a whole week and make one decision that gets me done the thing in one hour and i'm or i could just try super hard the whole week to to get something done and do you know, I've learned about lions recently because I have this shamanic tarot that brings archetypes from, from the forest and from animals. And I've learned that uh, like lions actually, they sleep more than 20 hours per day. Can you believe that? They're the sense. biggest biggest leaders of the savannas and they, they, they're huge time sleepers. This is so I mean, interesting. Sleeping Pedro. is amazing. Also, when I... <laughs> When I do the psychology, like I do have a psychologist that I talk to and then she's always like asking me to like, did you write your dreams? And and like she's so obsessed when she's like, oh, you have this moment, you have this moment of transformation in your life. And what you should be doing is try to take some weeks and kind of be in the stage of like almost sleeping, almost awake and then writing down all your dreams and trying to assess like what's behind the things and let this speak to you. So you need to kind of create this space. And I guess, I mean, there is this book, 
I read I forgot the Society of Sleep. I don't know remember this 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 person that wrote this book about like the lack of sleep that is obsession in our society and how it's damaging us. And I think yeah, it's a good point when you're talking again connecting with the topic of coffee and uh, this obsession that we have about being efficient and being awake and resolving things and getting things done and and in computers and quantifying ourselves as if we were also some sort of like system of data right and um, and that that is kind of like a potential way in which you kind of can get lost and not look at the essential and i guess when you are saying like upside down thinking it's just like you're trying to like shake things up turn everything upside down and see what is stuck inside of the box which is kind of what matters and then you can put it back up and then work out of just the essential parts that's a very nice synthesis so for example connecting to the efficiency topic uh, why are we treating ourselves as human doers if we are human beings mm -hmm. why we are not allowing time and space to just be human yeah, yeah right? it comes this is the basis yeah. of, of everything including business yeah but it's not about yes, doing it's about it's about um, being more mythical finding meaning in the doing mm -hmm. we need to yes. be something then to do something with quality not the other way around there's a very good book i would recommend uh talking about uh, the ess essence of things uh, essentialism the disciplined pursuit of less yeah um and mm -hmm. in the beginning of our conversation you were talking about picking the battles So mm -hmm. this book, since I, I know you like structure and frameworks, this book uh, some, somehow structures very well the, the thinking about how you can wisely pick good battles and therefore live better and work better as a natural consequence of that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yes, I would love to get also the link to the book. I can also share it here in the description of the of our podcast and um, as our time uh, starts reaching towards the end i wanted to ask you like are there any other things we will you like to share about what you think in doing is there any other thing that you would like to comment in the world be controversial create reasons to be cancelled in the modern <laughs> cancel culture of 2022 <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a challenge for me to be cancelled because I'm already offline. I basically don't exist, Pedro. I'm, I'm an hologram speaking to you because I don't have Instagram or WhatsApp or whatever. So not even I don't Twitter. know from where I would be cancelled. Maybe from my beauty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well. Even your church is going on now. Hmm. I don't know. I think I think I want to be loved more than cancelled. I will not say anything controversial. So I would no. try to conform and to and to pretend that I'm nice instead oh. of being deadly frank. You're nice. You're nice and it's very nice that you made the time to come here and talk to us. I mean, we will be editing this and getting the highlights. And then sharing on the social medias. I do know you are on LinkedIn, so you're not uh, absolutely um, gone and from Amish, the internet. Almost, but not what? entirely yet. What do you mean almost? You're almost on almost LinkedIn? Almost an Amish. Amish, you know? Amish. Oh, yeah, Amish person, yes, I do know them, yeah. That's, yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> Patricia, thanks so much for, for taking the time, talking to us here and sharing all your wisdom and learning I think that's really valuable and I think, yes, I hope that people can get the best out of here and we will synthesize this, we'll cut it in other formats, we'll send you all the links and yes, I hope to have you back here and to see where you are in a few months or in a few years, uh, it will be very interesting. Can I, can I make a question? For sure. Please. I have a brief upside down moment. 
So yeah, pretending absolutely. I'm an interviewer. Yeah. Um, what is your current controversial thinking? Thoughts? About, about what? Anything. Bo uh... What would you say to be cancelled? No, I'm just joking. It was just like a kind of a satire on this culture that now it's like does not doesn't want to have like some different ideas. It's like I think we do live in a time where like um, heterodoxy is not a commonly accepted concept, even among um, yeah, so-called intellectuals. And so I was kind of like joking about that in a way that uh, I was commenting on this sort of cultural phenomena and just it was a joke. Okay, so can, can I elaborate on this joke before we conclude? Sure. Because it just occurred me, Pedro. Um, so there's this, there was during the, the pandemic, this huge, big time controversial uh, thinking about vaccines, right? That's so the correct. world was divided between the vaccinated and the anti-vax. So my yeah. controversial contribution to that um, events would be the following. Interestingly, if we move from one extreme to the other, if we want to understand the thinking of an anti-vax and a vaccinated person and find evidence towards why you should have a vaccine and why you shouldn't, we will understand in the end of the day that the motivation is the very same. Yeah. So this is why I think that upside down thinking, upside down doing might be more natural than we believe because our human needs haven't changed it. Just our interpretation of what we should do from our needs. Yeah. So I think that we need to reconcile more than canceling each other. This yeah. would be the most upside down thinking act, in my opinion, in this polarized times. Think yeah. about the motivation. And how do we vote for you to be pres the next president? What is the number? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do hope that a woman gets elected in, in Brazil. In, is, is, in, there, is there in, any candidate? There is a female candidate, right? Um, there Sorry, are two, I'm, I think. But... I'm a bit a part of the election. Yeah. Are you? Interesting. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah, not <laughs> Why? I'm not, not the very you, you don't vote anymore? As, although uh, you're Brazilian? I, won't, I won't vote this year. I didn't register yet. Yeah. Mm, okay. Unfortunately. Or fortunately. I don't know. But I do hope to vote for a woman in Brazil. I think the future needs to be feminine, otherwise yes, it won't I, exist. I, I, can, uh, I This I agree 100%. Since many years, I think there is like a... And it could be... Yeah, it could be feminine in a broader sense possible. Uh, but yes, I agree that this is the time for the feminine energy to shine. Even and a feminine man, right? I'm not talking exactly. about women. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm the saying. The feminine yeah. energy, the yin energy, exactly. more yes. receptive. Yes, I completely agree. I 100% agree on this. Otherwise, we won't be around. Yes. Well, we will be some some ghosted spirits in some lost uh, dark matter black hole. After some whatever catastrophe that might have been caused, but we hope not to get there, and we hope to be able to stay here so that we can have another podcast. So, <laughs> so thank you, Pedro. Thanks so it was much. It's a pleasure for talking time. to you. Yeah, like after so long. Yes, exactly. We should be catching up all the time. And so, therefore, we have a good excuse with those podcasts. Yeah, thanks so much. Hope to see you soon, maybe in Brazil in the beginning of next year. I'll be there for a few months. So I'm cool. sure if we if we want, we can make it happen. And, and talk uh, offline. Exactly, talk offline. What is that? No, absolutely. <laughs> I like I like offline world too. Analogic conversation. Exactly. It would be great. Amazing. <laughs> yes, great, great stuff. So have a wonderful day. Enjoy your time. Thank and uh, be safe and uh, and let um 
and let us know if you are around and we let you know if you are around. Thank you, Thanks Pedro. Thanks so much, Patricia. Bye-bye. Ciao.